So in chapter one, we're going to talk about matter, energy, and measurement. And I'm going to split this into two lessons. Each lesson will be followed by some practice problems and some additional problems where if you're struggling, you can see the problem with the answers worked out. After you've watched both lessons, you should do problem set one. Chemistry is the study of matter, its properties, and the changes it undergoes. Chemistry is tied to many other fields such as medicine, biochemistry, green energy, and technology. So it really is at the root of all our, of our other sciences. There are different types of matter. We have elements, which are composed of only one type of atom, and those elements can be either monatomic, as pictured in box A, or diatomic, pictured in box B. Diatomic elements are two atoms of the same element bonded together. There are seven diatomic elements on the periodic table. We remember them using the acronym Brinkelhoff, Br for bromine, I for iodine, N for nitrogen, Cl for chlorine, H for hydrogen, O for oxygen, and F for fluorine, Brinkelhoff. Then we have compounds. Compounds, as shown in box C, are two or more different elements chemically combined. Because they are chemically put together, they can only be separated by chemical means. And in the last box, we have a picture of elements and compounds together forming a mixture. We can classify that matter by two different categories. The state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, or composition of matter. Are they elements, compounds, or are they a mixture, homogeneous, heterogeneous? And we'll talk about each of these. The three states of matter, as I just mentioned, are solid, liquid, and gas. You can see in this picture, solid is depicted by ice, our liquid is water, and then our gas is water vapor. So it's the same element, water, H2O, in three different states of matter. This is also known as a physical change because you are not changing the actual properties of the substance. You are only changing the state of matter. As I mentioned, we can also classify matter based on composition. So the first thing you ask yourself, is the sample that you're looking at uniform throughout? If it's uniform throughout, then it is considered homogeneous. The prefix homo means same. If it is not uniform throughout, then it is a heterogeneous mixture. So an example of a heterogeneous mixture might be chocolate chip cookie dough. You're not guaranteed to get the same amount of chips in every spoon of dough. Or salad dressing that's made up of water, oil, vinegar, and various spices. Homogeneous mixtures might be something like Kool-Aid. When the Kool-Aid is completely dissolved in the water, it's consistent throughout, or salt water. Everything is evenly distributed. If it's homogeneous, you then have to ask yourself, does it have a variable composition? If the answer is no, it does not have a variable composition, that means it's a pure substance. So it's either an element or a compound an element being one type of atom, and a compound being two or more different atoms chemically combined. If it does have a variable composition, then that means it is a homogeneous mixture and it is classified as a solution. All solutions are considered homogeneous. As I just mentioned in the previous flowchart, 
a substance does not have a variable composition. It can be broken down into, t into two types. Elements, which is made up of one type of atom, and it cannot be decomposed into a simpler substance. It is in its smallest state. Or a compound, which is two or more different elements chemically combined, and it can be broken down into its smaller substances because it contains more than one type of element. But to do so, it must be through a chemical process. Atoms are the building blocks of matter. Each element is made of a unique kind of atom, but it can be made of more than one atom of that kind. So here you see oxygen, O2. It's part of Brinkelhoff. A compound is made of atoms from two or more different elements. So here you have the example H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. If I have two carbons, one oxygen, and six hydrogens, I form ethanol. Carbon dioxide is CO2, one carbon, two oxygens. And then other examples are ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, and aspirin. So if I change the ratio of carbons, oxygen, and hydrogens, I then ch change the structure of the compound, I change its name, and its physical and chemical properties as well. There are currently 118 named elements on the periodic table. Only five elements make up 90% of the Earth's crust. They are oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and calcium. Only three elements make up 90% of the human body. Oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Note the importance of oxygen in both the Earth's crust and the human body. The human body, I'm sure you um, already knew, but most people don't realize that the Earth's crust is almost 50% oxygen. Here we see some common elements and their symbols. Now, I don't expect you to memorize all of the elements. In fact, I give you a reference table, and the first 20 elements are actually listed on it for you. One thing that I do want to say is that if an element is made up of more than one letter, the first letter you can see is capitalized, and the second letter is lowercase. A lot of the names of the elements come from their name, so carbon, C, fluorine, F. However, other elements do not. Silver is a G, but it comes from the Greek, excuse me, the Latin word argentum, or AU for gold comes from aurum. So some of them are intuitive while others are not. And the only way to get used to, to them are actually practice. As I just said, compounds are made up of two or more different elements chemically combined. They have a definite composition, meaning that if you change the ratio of the atoms in the compound, that means you're going to form something else. Mixtures usually exhibit the properties of the substances that make them. As I already said, they can be heterogeneous with a variable composition throughout or homogeneous with a constant composition throughout. Homogeneous mixtures are referred to as solutions because they have an even distribution of the molecules in whatever the solvent is, usually in water in chemistry. There are two types of properties. You heard me mention one already, physical properties. 
and then there are chemical properties. A physical property can be observed without the substance changing into another substance. For example, water in the solid state, liquid state, or gas state. Some examples of physical properties other than state of matter include color, odor, density, melting point, boiling point, and hardness. These are constant for a particular substance. Here you see an example of a distillation setup that they're using on salt water where the water is um, evaporated uh, to the gas state, travels through a condenser, and then is collected on the right hand side as pure water, leaving the salt behind. Normally we use a distillation setup for liquids, like a liquid within a liquid. So Listerine um, can contain alcohol. So water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, alcohol boils at about 78 degrees Celsius. So we could use distillation to separate the two liquids in a mixture because they have different boiling points. The water would come through the condenser first and we would collect the poor, um, sorry, the alcohol has a lower boiling point, 78 degrees, would come through the condenser first and we would collect that in the receiving flask. And once we've collected that, then we could continue to vaporize the substance and then get the pure water. Chemical properties can only be observed when a substance is changed into another substance. So the way to remember a chemical property is you cannot get back what you started with. It's completely changed into something else. So if I burn wood, I can't get back my wood. I'm only going to have carbon ash. If I take um, hydrogen and oxygen here and I burn it, I'm going to make water. I can't get back the hydrogen and oxygen gas because it burned. Flammability is a chemical property. If I dissolve a piece of metal in acid, it usually bubbles producing hydrogen gas and the metal turns into um, a salt usually um, because it combines with the acid. And we'll talk about that later on in the semester. But chemical properties, I cannot get back what I started with. Physical properties, it's still the same substance, it's just changed into a different form. Two other important words in this unit are intensive and extensive. And they're both um, characterized um, for different aspects of identifying a substance. An intensive property does not depend on the amount of the substance present. So density, boiling point, color. It doesn't matter how much I have of the substance, the boiling point's not going to change, the density's not going to change, the color won't change. An extensive property does depend on the amount of substance. So examples of extensive properties are mass, volume, and energy because all of those are dictated by the amount of substance that I'm dealing with. So some examples of physical changes, we were just talking about that, um, does not change the composition of the substance, state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, temperature, and volume, all physical changes. Chemical changes that can result in new substances are include combustion, which is something burning in the presence of oxygen, oxidation, so like a can rusting, and decomposition, something breaking down into its components. We're just going over physical change again. Um, what we're showing here is that when ice changes states of matter, whether it be water, um, solid in the ice state or vaporized, it still contains two hydrogens and one oxygen in each molecule. It's just how close those molecules are together which dictates the state of matter. In the course of a chemical reaction, which is a chemical change, as we said, a new substance is formed. So here we have a copper penny and it reacts with nitric acid 
and it produces a blue solution of copper 2 nitrate and a brown gas called nitrogen dioxide, which is not very healthy. Some physical properties, like color, help us to see that a chemical change has occurred. Some other indications that a chemical change has occurred might be a change in temperature, the test tube getting really cold or really warm, bubbling indicating the formation of a gas, or a precipitate forming. That's some solid sludge at the bottom of a test tube. Mixtures are fixed, physically put together, therefore they can be separated by physical means. Some methods are filtering, distillation, which I explained to you was separation by boiling point, and chromatography. You might have done this in a biology class where you separate molecules based on molecular size and um, their affinity for the solvent. So you get different colors on a piece of paper. We can also separate by decantation, meaning pouring off. And we can also separate by evaporation. So if I had a glass of salt water, I could heat the salt water, the water would vaporize and boil off, and I would be left with the salt. Infiltration, you have to have a solid substance. There has to be something that has a larger particle size that's going to get trapped in the filter paper and then allow a liquid to pass through. The liquid that passes through is called the filtrate and then the solid that gets stuck is the solid or it could be the precipitate. Distillation, as I said, is separation based on boiling point. So I have a homogeneous mixture and so that means it's a solution and I can separate in its, into its components based on their individual boiling points. Chromatography separates substances, as I said, on their basis of the substance to adhere to the um, solvent and by molecule size. And then it puts a dye on the paper, depending on what it is that you're separating. So this ends lesson one of chapter one, and there'll be a second lesson to finish up this chapter.